Well, I am here with Senator Lindsey Graham. And Senator Lindsey Graham, how you doing today? Good, good, Anne. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. You know, it seems like we had Benghazi, now the Ukraine, and even Venezuela. Is this symptomatic of a weak foreign policy? Yes, uh, a weak and indecisive U.S. president always invites aggression. You saw it with Jimmy Carter. Now you're seeing it with Obama. And, yeah, this is a trend all over the world. Uh, Syria was a defining moment. You know, uh, this is not a good time for U.S. foreign policy. I was talking to a military veteran, and he said he would rather have total domination with a strong military so we would have fewer casualties rather than the other way around. Yeah, that's exactly it. You'll have the smallest Navy since 1915. You'll have less than 240 ships, the smallest Air Force in modern history, and the smallest Army since World War II. This is insanity. The world is very dangerous. The Iranians are testing us with their nuclear program. Our allies are afraid and our friends are emboldened, and we're taking uh, our military down to historically low spending levels. In terms of gross domestic product, it's been historically 5% plus in time of peace spent on the military. To me, it's the number one priority of the federal government. At the end of the 10-year window, under Obama's budget and sequestration combined, we'll be spending less than 3% of GDP on our national security as the world gets more dangerous and as NATO starts, you know, their NATO countries are spending very low amounts on their defense. So this is a, a bad formula here. Well, you know, as politicians up there or in Washington, D.C., are we uh, sure that there's not going to be another large-scale war? Is that why we're pulling back here? Well, you hear this after every war, you know, after Vietnam, we'll never need a big military again, and it goes on and on and on. Well, Afghanistan and Iraq were situations where we did have a big military footprint. But we have obligations and national security needs throughout the world. What if North Korea, you know, their leader woke up tomorrow and said, hey, now's the time to take the South? You know, you got to have an army that can fight two conflicts at the same time. But if you had to deal with the Iranian nuclear program, uh, to stop them from getting a nuclear weapon if negotiations fail. And I think the Iranians are watching us in the Ukraine and Syria and, and, and think Obama's weak. Well, all the F-22s and B-2s and F-35s would be needed. They're stealth aircraft. you got to modernize your weapons. The B-2 took us 20 years to develop that, that bomber. F-22, we don't have that many of them. So this budget of Obama, you can't modernize your weapons. And that gives you an advantage. So I'll go back to what the gentleman told you. I'm not looking for a fair fight. When we send our American military in harm's way, I want to have an overwhelming advantage. And Obama's budget guts the military in numbers and in terms of capability. Absolutely. I mean, I was listening to something last night. We only have, like, nine aircraft carriers. Yeah, well, we're, we got ten. We're going to go to nine, maybe eight. And when you're talking about pivoting to Asia, what are you going to pivot with? You know, the Chinese are building up their military. They're building aircraft carriers. You know, the number one priority of the federal government is to defend the nation. And if you eliminate the entire Defense Department's budget, it doesn't begin to balance the budget. We're $17 trillion in debt, not because of defense spending, because of entitlements. The baby boomers retiring 10000 a day. Social Security and Medicare are driving the long-term debt requirements of the country. That's all we need to to salvage these programs by modernizing Social Security and Medicare. So this idea that we can't afford to defend ourselves is ridiculous. We have cut the Defense Department. $489 billion just a few years ago, $89 billion on top of that. Obama's budget literally guts the military. And if you want to invite aggression, if you want another 9-11, keep doing what we're doing. Absolutely. Now, what about uh, Benghazi? Last week, you were uh, you uh, went forth and said that uh, we need a joint select committee. Yes. Do you think that uh, with what's happening in the Ukraine, is that going to put that on the back burner again, or what's going to happen, Lindsay? Well, I hope we can focus on our national security. Um, I hope we can walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> Dealing with the Ukraine, we need to pass sanctions against the Russians, the oligarchs, the people who fund Putin need to have the visas restricted. They should be able to travel around the world and live in luxury. We should kick Russia out of the G8 and the G20. We should hit them in the wallet. You know, at the end of the day, Putin hates democracy. He hates it within his country. 
He's not looking for free and fair elections. Uh, that's the way he's maintained power is to suppress democratic institutions. So he's threatened by democratic countries around him. And we should empower democracies, not let him destroy them. So uh, at the end of the day, you know, we'll just see where all this goes. Benghazi is system failure. The reason we need to investigate and get to the bottom of Benghazi is when the systems fail, somebody has to be held accountable. Not one person's been fired for letting the consulate become a death trap. I do believe that we've been provided false information uh, after the attack, that what Susan Rice said about a protest doesn't hold water, that people manipulated the intelligence to create a political story uh, helpful to the president seven weeks before the election. I think Mike Morrell, the number two at the time in charge of the CIA, needs to be called back to the Congress because he was told by the head of the CIA in Libya this was not, not a protest, and he went ahead and helped prepare the talking points that talked about demonstrations and removed all references to al-Qaeda. I am not going to stop till we get to the bottom. I think the Obama administration manipulated the evidence after the attack to protect them uh, seven weeks before an election. No one's been held accountable for the deteriorated security before the attack. This is Hillary Clinton's responsibility. And during the attack, I'm still not convinced there's nothing we could do to help these people. So I hope the House will form a joint committee. When you look at these issues separately, things fall through the crack. Rather than have three separate committees looking at Benghazi, we should have one committee hearing the same story, interviewing people as a uh, cohesive team. If you don't do that, you're never going to get to the bottom of Benghazi. And I and I guess you'd like to see uh, Trey Gowdy on that joint committee. Oh, my God. Trey ah! has been a superstar. He has asked the most penetrating questions. Jason Chaffetz, Trey Gowdy, uh, Jim Jordan. But at the end of the day, how can you say you've got to the truth about Benghazi if Susan Rice is never called as a witness? She was the U.N. ambassador who appeared on right. five Sunday TV shows five days after the attack talked about al-Qaeda being decimated on the run, the, the compound, the consulate was strongly, significantly, substantially secured. It was not. Talking about a protest that never happened based on a hateful video, it, minimizing the terrorist uh, aspects of this. How could she have said such things in light of the, the information coming from Libya? So I just will not rest until she is called to testify. And, and quite frankly, she said the reason... She was on television and not Hillary Clinton. Got to remember, she was the ambassador of the United Nations with no responsibility for Benghazi. She said Hillary was tired, had a tough week. Well, if that's the case, then she shouldn't even think about being running for president. And uh, so I want to, I want to have Susan Rice uh, ask questions about Benghazi. She's appeared on national television shows, but she's never been before the Congress. And to me, that's a must. Absolutely. Uh, two more questions. Do you think, oh, this is, has to goes to your election, do you think that we have so many people running in the primaries? Is it a statement on your performance or more on the state of the Republican Party? Well, you know, having a lot of people run for an office is not a bad thing as far as I'm concerned. They have to do the same thing I, I will have to do, prove to the people of South Carolina who's best able to represent us. They have a common thread, I think, in terms of qualifications and philosophy. I think I've got a, a good story to tell about being a conservative leader who gets things done. But it's not the number of people running us at the end of the day who, who can best serve South Carolina, who can be our voice in Washington at a time when Washington is broken, uh, who can deliver for South Carolina. So I welcome uh, the contest. We're in good shape. We'll just keep doing what we're doing. And my last question, are you amazed when uh, they, people, the people ask for bipartisanship and working together, and then when there is some working together that they get mad and uh, that there was a compromise to begin with? Well, at the end of the day, finding common ground and getting results is necessary. Like the Port of Charleston is responsible for one in five jobs in our state. You can't deepen the Port of Charleston without helping someone else deepen their port. There's a time to work together, like Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill to save Social Security. There's a time to fight Obamacare, Benghazi, standing up for Ronald Reagan's view of how to protect the nation. Um, I think I can throw a punch, but I also can get something done. 
you got the hard right uh, and the hard left. I'm a Ronald Reagan conservative. If I get 80% of what I want, that's a good day. You know, for the country to survive, we're going to have to find ways to fix problems that are going to make us grease if we don't watch it. But being able to fight the Democrats is one thing. I think I can do that. I think I can fight, but I can also get things done. And um, at the end of the day, the country has to remember the Ronald Reagan model. And that is being practical, being principled. But if you can get 80% of what you want, that's a good day. Go back and get the 20% later. And if we agree on 80% of the issues, you're my friend, not my foe. That's sort of my philosophy. I think it served the country well. I think it served the Republican Party well. Absolutely. But there is seems to be a lot of dysfunctionality up there, Lindsay. Yes, ma'am. It's broken <laughs> as bad as I've seen it. I've seen it. But the way to fix it is to be able to throw a punch and at the same time get something done. We have got to save our country from becoming brief, and we need to win the Senate in 2014. If I get the nomination of the Republican Party, there will be no contest in the general election. I know I can win. The Democrats know I can win, and they're not going to fill the candidate here and spend a bunch of money, which means there'll be more money for us to spend in other places to pick up the Senate. And if we got the Senate back in, the first witness I'd want to call if we had a majority in the Senate, is Eric Holder, and ask him, where's the constitutional authority for the president to delay Obamacare about 15 times unilaterally? Where in the Constitution does the president have the ability to change a law because it's politically inconvenient? That'd be the first uh, hearing I'd want to have. Well, doesn't that go to the STOP Act that uh, Tom yeah. Rice has put yeah, out Tom there? Tom Rice is a very clever guy doing a good job trying to find a way to give the House standing to sue the Obama administration uh, in the Supreme Court. But what I would like to do is help Tom. But if we had the Senate majority, we could work with the House majority to actually push the administration. Everything that passes the House dies in the Senate. It's time to fire Harry Reid. To fire Harry Reid, we've got to pick up six seats and hold on the ones we got. I can hold on to this seat in South Carolina. Thank you a lot, Ann. Thank you very much, Senator Lindsey Graham. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.